Jake, it's great to have you. You know, I've, I've seen you at all the trade shows for many, many years. You saw Nikki when he was a young man. Yes, sir. Uh, here. Um, a lot of the interviews that we've done on, the, on this podcast, uh, we've really tried to document a lot of history. Sure. A lot of the people who innovated and created um, the sport. Mm-hmm. Um, you have been a huge influence with the Marlin world, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But sure. uh, before all that, you were a tarpon guy, a, a skiff guide. Yes. Uh, and you're still at 82 years young. You just fished last night at Bahia Honda. That's correct. And I'll I, bet you a thousand to one it was uh, a falling tide. You're pretty close. <laughs> you're pretty um, close. It was the end of the falling tide because it's early in our early in our day. We st- we started last night like in the daylight for the first hour because we didn't have enough tide to get a full trip in. So we went out and and it gave me the opportunity to show my angler all the hazards where every trap line is and where where the different different spears are hanging down off the old bridge and stuff, the stuff mm-hmm. that we have to negotiate around in the dark when I'm in the pitch black, when I'm following these fish and right. we don't generally fish anywhere near the bridge. We're a mile or two up in the bay when I'm fighting these fish. But yeah. if fish in light tackle, sometimes they get down by the bridge and I have to have my people understanding what's going sure, on. I, I, I understand. What, what, um, what happens if it's an incoming tide? It's just not the, as the good. Tar- the tarpon are laying underneath the bridge in an area that you can't really get them with a fly rod. And so the tarpon don't leave. It's just harder to get a bite. Well, the tarpon come in there every evening. They move in as the as the as the tide is is beginning to. Well, it doesn't matter what the tide's doing. As as the afternoon is gone, later in the season, like in in starting in April, but in as the water temperature gets up in the high 70s and 78 right now it's 75 75 and a half but when it gets up to about 78 all the way up to 89 those fish are moving the fish that are at bay honda where i'm fishing tonight spent the last night at the seven mile bridge up off of key west bank same exact fish the night before they were up off of duck key and they're moving down the Keys for that first month or so. The fish that I'm getting right now, because those Oceanside fish aren't coming yet, are fish that came across from Cancun, from that peninsula out there. They come across the Gulf in March. And they come in out on the wrecks in the Gulf of Mexico, out by the towers and all those wrecks out there. They lay in the deeper water where it's warmer until the temperature gets up and then they start moving in the channel. So all of the, all the guides are fishing the, the daytime guides, what I used to, do. they're all fishing the fish in the channels on, on the Gulf side in the back between all the islands, all the way from, from Spanish Harbor, all the way down to uh, Key West. How much of that is speculation versus hard data? As far as the migration you're talking about? Well, I, I was in a tagging program years ago that where we where I tagged forty eight hundred tarpon at the seven mile bridge. Forty eight hundred. Yeah. That's how many and you caught to tag. That's how many I tagged, yeah. Forty eight hundred in yeah, how many years? Gosh. About fifteen years we were tagging. Wow. And, and and what did you what did those tags show you? They were there's a guy named William Kruger, Captain Bill Kruger from Woods Hole Institute. He was a University of New Hampshire, I think. But he was at Woods Hole Institute, and he ran that program. And basically what they were doing was trying to figure out where the fish were spawning and where they were going and coming from. From the data that I got from him before he died, he fished with me for many years. He died at 90-something. Bill said that they were five general groups of fish that we were fishing here in the Florida Keys. And this is the only time that they get together. And some of the fish, one group was coming up from Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic and that, that chain of islands around the bottom of Cuba and coming across. Well, without without acoustic tags, how do you know this this path is? These were these were fish that that were being tagged at the seven mile with spaghetti tags, and when they're recaptured, they gather the data from everyone. And they just added that data all up, and there's still fish being caught with those tags in them. Interesting. I, I mean, thought the spaghetti tags were just for um, 
just they just have a number. They don't have satellite. No, no, there's no satellite stuff, but 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 they know where the fish are are, are recaptured. So what they right, do right. you document what you do? If they you send you, they send you, you they used to send us a postcard that say fish number so and so that you tagged on this date at the Seven Mile Bridge. Every one we tagged, we filled out a card with the date. Yeah, so the uh, estimated size of the fish. And then when they're recaptured, when they when they recapture that tag, that person has a phone number that they can call off of sure. that tag. Right. They report the fish where it was, the size, the date, and so forth. Right. And it could be a year or two years or five years or ten years. Yeah. But I tagged fish at the Seven Mile Bridge that were recaptured as far north as Virginia on the East Coast, all up the West Coast and all across the the Texas coast and Louisiana coast. Fish that were tagged at the Seven Mile Bridge. What year was this that you're catching these all these fish in Seven Mile? In the '60s and the '70s. Okay, so you were up to up to 19. Did you catch all these fish on fly or with no, these no, fish no. on bait at night? No, I, I was doing. I was doing back then. I had uh, starting in the in the '70s, I guess it was. We started tagging fish uh, at Seven Mile Bridge, and I had the the uh, tackle store fly shop at in Ferro Blanco in the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. And that was in the seventies and eighties up into 91. And that's, we were an official IGFA way station. So in the beginning they were killing most of the fish when we were tagging them. Right. And I would fish from 5 AM to, to 9 AM every morning for 90 days in a row. Then I would go out at 10 in the flats boat and fish 10 to 2 with a half a day flats fishing trip for tarpon. And then I would go out at 5 in the evening and fish till 9 at night Oh my on God. a bait trip again. And I Holy did three trips God. a day for at least 20 years, 25 years, I guess. That's crazy. Just That's all we did was tarpon. That's how I made my living. Sure. I mean, was, you made a – what was your, we were what making, was your day was a, rate back then? There was a time – I remember when it was was two hundred a day, two fifty a day. That's a so, lot though from for that. that yeah, but that, that was for a full day. Oh, that's for, for those, yeah. Yeah, these these trips were one hundred and fifty bucks for each a four hour trip. Right. What was the fishing like back then? What, I mean, I can't even imagine how many fish there were. I can tell you this: that 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 there was a lot of fish. I mean, there was there was a lot of fish. We had like eight boats fishing out of Ferro Blanco that fished every tide. Fished a morning tide and an evening tide that were continuing. Billy Rubito and uh, Donnie Braswell. So how many fish would you see come down the flat during the day when you were flat? When I was flat fishing. fishing in the daytime, I remember fishing on that flat where sure. fish was. Well, I was out there. Did you find – who found that channel? Well, we were fishing out there in the – in the 70s and uh it, you know i i remember Stu telling me one time if you learn every channel from the from the east end to the west end of the seven mile bridge you can fish there for tarpon from march to july for the rest of your life and you'll never run out of fish wow so, so they used to come just down learning there in that bridge. i used to i used to just go out there and and have my wife tow me around wear a mask just hold on to a rope and just be looking at the bottom and charting the bottom. I did the same thing at Baja Honda. Why were you charting the bottom? Because I wanted to know where the fish were going to be moving and laying. I wanted to know every every drop off and every piece of coral head and stuff. Mm-hmm. So because it, tell it, you this, this has nothing to do with the flats fishing. The flats fishing, sure. those fish would overnight up there at that channel on the on the east end of of Seven Mile Bridge, which is which is like from Key West Bank. Down, down to Pigeon Key in that area. That's where those fish would overnight. That group of fish would leave. And in the old days, when Albert first started down there, but long before he was there, I was out there. No, th- there was maybe Steve would be out there, but there wouldn't be anybody out there. Steve and, Huff, yeah, uh huh. But very, very few people. Mike Hewlett would show up once in a while. I'll, I'll explain to you my my theory that I did for maybe twenty years. I fished the same schools of fish from dawn until 
five o'clock in the afternoon. I'd be on the same schools of fish. Never fish a different school. How big was that the, school? There would be a there would be a group of anywhere between twenty and five hundred fish in each pod, and the fish would leave, and they would come right along the bridge, coming from the east end of the Seven Mile Bridge. Sure. When they got to those first group of flats, sometimes they'd even be, depending on the tide falling or incoming, if it's incoming, they'd stay right up by the bridge, even between the bridges. But as soon as they hit that first drop off there, east, east, they would come out and they'd go out that flat until it got deep enough where the water was what was maybe three to four feet deep. Then they would turn put big smiles on their face and cruise right up onto the flat. Once they got up on that flat, they're just going, shh, 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 and they're smiling. And we would just sit there and watch them coming for 20 minutes out on the point, all the way out by the end of that creek. And they would work their way across that flat, and, and i just sit there and wait for them. When they would be up and happy, and when they came into that little – creek that comes out there with a white spot at the end of it mm-hmm. as they came across there i would be back probably a casting length from the west end of that creek west side of that creek as they came hit the other side of the channel if the current was coming in they would be heading southwest if the current was going out they would be heading Northwest, but they're just coming straight at you. Would you get a bite like almost every cast? I would put my angler at an angle where my boat is laying north south. The angler is dead right in front of the fish, so he is actually casting right at the face of the fish. Sure. So the fish would never see the fly line, would never see the leader. He would only see the back of the fly swimming away from him. Maybe I would give you an angle as any fish that's coming at you. This much of an angle so that the fish is, is doing this. Sure. So that's basically how everybody fishes so for tarpon. Th- that's what we were doing. We sure. Would, we would throw it right in front of them. And we were in those days, we were stripping. I was using five odd hooks and 100 pound bite tippet and big flies. What like kind this. of class tippet were you using? Were you using? I, I always used 20. 20, yeah. Yeah. I just, I always, well, in the beginning, we were using 12 and then we went to 16. That's right. Because I remember, I don't know if you went through that stage yeah, where it was 12 it, it, light, even without a bite tip. Right. Yeah. From the Miami Rod and Reel Club. Yep. That's correct. Yeah. And we, we fished 12, then eventually got, got this 16 and then went to 20. Right. But then once I got to 20, I just fished mostly 20 unless I was doing something for records or something. But right. we, we would sit there, and th- and that first pod would come through, and you would hook a fish. So once the fish is on, then I would just pull away after the fish. Back then, I was fishing. I had a Willie Roberts, and then I had a Hughes, and then I wound up with a 78. I wound up with a uh, w- w- with one of the first uh, uh, shy poke boats. So these are great big heavy boats that we're pushing that are 18-foot aircraft carriers. Did you have that- trolling motors back then? We started with the trolling motors about 76, 77, uh-huh. and had the, the air pumps on the thing, two trolling motors sure. on the back. That's what I saw in Home Assassin so when what, I first got when there. When was the first year you guided? It was before the 70s? Yeah, I actually, I came to the Keys with my dad on a boat delivery in 1951, and we delivered a boat from Ocean City, New Jersey, to Marathon. And we got to fish... We got here before our our train ticket and bus tickets. Uh, we got we we got here ten days early, so we got to go out and and, and drift fish out in the Florida Bay um, with the old railroad bridge. There was only the one bridge there. Of course, we go through there and go up there, and we would drift. We'd go up the middle of Marathon and then drift back towards the Seven Mile Bridge. And the only bait that we had, we had these old. Uh, wooden rods with with Ocean City reels, just conventional reels, and swivels with a – you had like a three-way swivel with a hook on it with a catgut leader and a, and a hook, and then another sinker on the bottom and another hook down there. And this was the first time I ever saw a freezer on a boat. This old 1949 Ravovich had a freezer, and it was full of these white containers about this big that were – 
full of frozen clams. So we would put a clam on each hook, really? go out there, turn the motor off, and just drift along and hold on. What was biting and those clams? I, I, caught, I caught 31 species of fish in 10 days with my dad out there. We caught redfish, bluefish, flounder, um Wow, Groupers, crazy how snappers, prolific the fishing was. Snook, everything. You could look down in the water, no matter how deep the water was, and if the wind was blowing 30, there was no such thing as marl in the water. We didn't have that, that, that the water turns that split pea soup color yeah, when it blows. Dingy, yeah. We didn't have that then. It could be blowing a gale, and you could see every grain of grass and every crab walking on the grass. Wow. Didn't matter how deep it was. It was cleaner than anything I ever saw in the Bahamas. How old were you at that time? Nine. Nine. So then that was 1951. And then... Uh, Before I was born, I'm 71. Yeah, we went. We wound up fishing and going home. And then I always remembered that. So when I got home, I worked up in... New Jersey. My dad had a marina. I grew up around a marina mm-hmm. in Summers Point, New Jersey. So, so when when I got home from my service, I went to uh, I went back up to New Jersey for a little while, and I wound up deciding to didn't want to be there. Came to the Keys, and I walked in a tackle shop and looking for a job, and a guy gave me a job, and I wound up driving a boat out of the Bahia Honda Marina, really? just just as a mate. And for what year? Nineteen sixty-five. That's incredible. And I met Harry Snow Sr., Harry Snow Jr., which were kind of big. Harry Snow Sr., I guess, was really the first guide. He was the cook for the railroad when they were building the railroad, and he gave me a he gave me a John von Hoff tarpon reel. So how many guides were there back then? Ten? None. There wasn't many, you know. I mean, it was, it was. I didn't actually start flats fishing until later. I started flats fishing, I think it was '67, and I fished out of my house. And I didn't. There wasn't enough fly fishermen to be a fly fishing guide, but every once in a while I would get somebody. But you were you started off being a mate. Uh, bait fishing in Bahia Honda, and you, I heard that you would uh, catch tarpon and then string the tarpon up on the side of the boat or yeah, something? Yeah, we put it, well, always, uh, you know, the the deal was, was was in in the beginning was everybody killed their tarpon to bring them to the dock. Like when I had my place at Ferro Blanco, we had these big things at Ferro Blanco with all the nails sticking through them. Right, for, for you promotion. just hang your fish up, and basically all of that, when you put them on the stringer there, you were basically bringing them in there to, 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 to get advertisement there was no internet there was really no television fishing uh it was it was mainly uh people would advertise in saltwater sportsman or outdoor life or field and stream and i never advertised i just basically we hung the fish up and somebody would see the fish and come down and say hey can i do that yeah no problem then you just go dump them in the ocean later uh, in, in the beginning they were just dumped in the ocean but when I was at Ferro Blanco, when I had the place, we had a lady that used to come by there at like at night. We would leave them hang, and she would come by and had a big bucket, and she would pull the scales off, and she made lampshades out of the scales. Wow. And then there was a dump truck that came in the middle of the night, took all the fish, and I don't know what they did with yeah. them. Did you ever feel bad about what was taking place back then? Or was just that was just Andy, the, the way it was? I, Nobody knew any better. I, I made a decision to to do a catch and release tarpon tournament out of my store at Ferro Blanco in 1981. And it was, I, I planned it for two years and I hired guides for a week. In prime time, the last week of, of May or the first week of mm-hmm. June, I forget which it was. And I had the guides hired two years in advance for a week. And then I started to put this thing together and advertised it. And this was a time when uh, the guys from Jackson Hole that, that started Sims and Tarpenware they had just started that organization there in Jackson. 
um, I was connected with them and we were friends. I convinced them to put their name on it, and we called it the Tarpenware Classic. And it was a catch-and-release tarpon tournament. It was the first ever catch-and-release tarpon tournament in the Florida Keys. Interesting. I had uh, Rob Fordyce and and uh, his brother uh, Rick, Rick, and and uh, I can't remember how Ru- many anglers were Rufus there. Rufus Wakeman was one of my anglers when uh-huh. he was a kid. So how many? And what kind of a field was there? Th- we had we had ten ten boats and twenty anglers. So and, two anglers per boat. And I had, uh, for five years, I had Bill Bill Elliott was our guy. He made that big tarpon, that tarpon head with the fly. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's, he, that, he was that's artist, on tarponware. Yes, for sure. That yeah. was, I, I had that original painting, and then I made 50, 50 copies of it. And each, everybody that fished in the tournament and every guy got a copy of each one. And each year we did a different uh-huh. a different picture so if it was a and that catch was catch and release and we made a we made tarpenware made a thing with different colors and i went to jt reese um fluger and uh who's the other one gray and got them to give me an average of the length between the upper jaw and the dorsal fin of a 50 pound fish a 70 pound fish a 90 pound fish a hundred pound fish, hundred and twenty pound fish, and then they made different colors on those lengths and had a little hook on the end of a thing that looked like one of those rainbow belts, had all the different colors in it, and you would hook it here and the bring the lip. fish up, yep. measure it right to the dorsal fin, and take a picture of it with a Polaroid camera holding today's newspaper <laughs> to verify <laughs> to <laughs> verify that you the caught day, it and what day. day it is and everything. Oh, that's funny. And that's how that's how we did that. Huh. that tournament you, and and no other tournament and i was when i did that tournament i was advertised i had bumper stickers that said save our tarp and stop kill tournaments wow I because i had because the gold cup started in 1964 yeah but that gold cup was a kill tournament that's what i'm saying though so that was right about the same time because, no this was i'm talking about this is 1981 oh much later but all the other tournaments were all kill tournaments mm-hmm. when, was, when did gold cup become a release tournament after Mayan, I don't right. remember the year. Late eighties, early nineties. Late eighties, yeah, no, probably, not quite that late. Mid eighties, uh, maybe. Yeah, I should have looked it up. The we, last one who won the kill term was Fordyce, right? And, and uh, yeah, and this and this the year the year that he started in my, in my tournament was uh, it, I needed a couple of guides and and uh, Earl Waters was guiding for me and he said I got a couple of young guys that are really good and he brought Rob that weighed about a hundred pounds. And, and and his and his big brother, <laughs> and and uh, that th- they fished in that first tournament, and you know I had some really cool people. I had all the people from Billy Klein and a bunch of guys from 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 all over that that fished that thing. It was right. a, it was a cool tournament, and we did it for four or five years. But I had these bumper stickers made up. To me, it was just bringing business to the keys. Sure. And, I had a booking service. I had young guides that I was starting out, and I was booking them, and it, it brought me people. But but I also had a real company, and I was selling reels and selling fly tackle. I mean, my whole deal was just bringing more people into the fly fishing deal, particularly the saltwater, because there wasn't that many saltwater fly fishermen in the in the sixties and seventies. It started in the mid seventies, and it just got got bigger from that. Is where the saltwater stuff did. Right, but. But I had these stickers that, that that I can't. They were blue, and they said "Save our tarp and stop kill tournaments." Interesting. And I was getting death threats from people that you have interviewed on your show that said you you can't stop us from killing these fish. We we'll lose all our customers. We'll never get another customer if we can't hang those fish. It's interesting with the Western dry rocks. There was an issue with some of the commercial guys and some of the fly guys. You know, when they were trying to shut it down because a lot of the permit were. Um, <laughs> Or it's, it was a spawning site, and sure. they wanted to make it like a, a you know a reserved area for like so many four or five months where no I one could that. fish there. Um, do you remember? Um, did you follow the Gold Cup and the Holly you quite know, closely? I, did you ever have aspirations I, I, to fish in that? No, my clients were. I had I had clients that would book me for a week, ten days. I fished Gary Loomis and I fished Don Green and guys that were 
fly fishermen, a lot of guys from the West Coast, Mel Krieger fished with me. And Danny Blanton used to come down here. Mm-hmm. I, had, I had a whole bunch of West Coast guys that came. But I, but I would put together groups to come in and book other guides. But my guys were not... Tournament fishermen. No, they, they, they wanted to come here and take off their shirts and, and shoes, get in that boat and be out there alone and, and watch these thousands of tarpon come fly. They'd hook the fish, stare at they catch that fish. Then we go back on the point and hook another one and catch another one and then go back. And probably we would have 10 to 20 major schools come past between dawn and 8 o'clock in the morning. Wow. Then I would, Those are big schools you're that, talking about. Giant schools. And then I would leave and I would drive through the bridge, ride around out in the bay, head to the west a little bit, and then... 15 minutes later, come back through the bridge down to the west and go out behind key. And I go out on that, go around the island and on the outside edge of that, and I'd start pulling east. And the same exact schools were coming at me. Come. And it was like an hour and 45 wow. minutes later. And then we would pick off those schools and catch those fish. And now that would be over by 10, 30 or so, the last fish would go. Then I would leave, and I'd drive up by Key West Bank and drive around and say, well, I got an idea where there might be some. And then we would drive up in the bay and come around and then come back through the bridge and come out and come down just west of Money Key and then turn out and fish the Money Key flat. Fifteen minutes later, here they come, the same schools. Hmm. And I would see fish that had a, had a shark bite on them, and they'd be at each spot. So we, I knew, I knew, that, I knew every one of those fish. Every one of these fish was the same fish, and same schools of fish. Mm-hmm. And then, then that fi- those fish, after they cast money, they would go right up to the bridge, come all the way down the, the bridge, and then at the picnic tables at uh, at, at uh, they would hit that, and then they'd come out around that thing, and we would go down where that where that first little channel comes out of there, and get on that white spot, and you would see them happy. They'd hit that thing, they'd explode, and then they'd roll in big smiles. Here they come again, the same fish. Crazy. That, were you only were you fishing like well, only one fly, or did you have a um, no, like, no, 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 like I a had, number of different flies? I because my, I would think all you had to do is just show them the fish, almost like any cockroach, and well, they're going to bite it, it. In the beginning, we would fish different color cockroaches, the orange quindillon. Did it make a difference? You think? And yeah, there was times when they would eat it. In the beginning, if the fly landed within 20 feet of the fish and it went plop the fish would swim over and eat it right but after a while that stopped happening as it got later on when we were fishing um well those fish would come by that little spot we catch them and by two o'clock in the afternoon the tide had changed and the fish were now swimming across the white sand at sunshine Mm -hmm. same fish then I would fish them there. Then I would go drop back and fish them at the other end, right at the beginning of Bay of Honda. Then I would fish them that whole length of Bay of Honda. And at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, they came around the, that little island at Bay of Honda and went in under the bridge, and I was going home. And then those same fish are the fish that I'm fishing all night, every night. That's crazy. And then the next day, those same fish came. And they still do it for thousands of years. The same fish are doing the same route. I got a question for you. Uh, I know that a lot of these fish are, are coming down, you know, from Isla Marotta, from Government Cut to get to Isla Marotta. They come down from there to uh, Seven Mile Bridge to Bahia Honda. I don't see a lot of big uh, numbers of fish come west from Bahia Honda, you know, down towards where we fish in, in the Lower Keys. Right? We, see, we see a number of fish, but... Um, Do you know where the Hojo it, sure. is? What it used to be that Howard Johnson house? Yeah. So those those big numbers used to come all the way down towards Key West? Oh, hell yeah. You probably never saw any other boats down there at the time. You are probably the only boat, right? Well, on Sherry Loaf Beach? Th- there, there was, yeah, there was always guys down there. I mean, we have a lot of guys that are gone, but there was always some guys down there. You know, Roy Lowe used to fish down that area, and, and, and Harry... Um, um, Joe Saladino was there for many, many years. Cal Cochran. A lot of the marathon guides. Steve was down there. Okay. You know, we, we, 
the thing different between marathon guys, what we call marathon, which was duck key to big pine key, that we called them the marathon guys. All of the marathon guys were like you. We all had our skiffs on trailers. We never had a dock, ever. Every boat in Alamrata was hanging on a dock someplace, and every boat in Key West was a, what, a dock. So they fished their 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 areas. Mm-hmm. But it was very rare to see a Key West guide in, in Marathon or, 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 or up the Keys. I mean, I would fish one day I'd launch in Key West and be fishing the Marquesas. The next day I'd be I'd be launching up at at, at Penny Camp Park and fishing up by Ocean Reef. Yeah, you, you yeah you had uh, much more dexterity than I thought. Jeez, yeah, what you were mostly just marathon. So you fished everywhere. Well, we, we, all, all the marathon guides. You know, you asked about the Gold Cup and stuff when, when Harry Spear and Steve and Dale Presno's guys were all, they were tournament guides. They all lived in Marathon and drove to Key West. They didn't live in, 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 right, in, right. in uh, Isle Morata. They, they would drive up there to fish. They were all, they were all Marathon guides. Mm-hmm. All, all the Marathon guys, we, we all had our boats on No, trailers. but I'm talking about you in general. You know, I didn't know you fished up in Penny Camp. Well, I lived on Summerlin. I I lived I next had, door. I had the third house over here on on um, Caribbean Drive. I have it's, a great uh, story with, with 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 Flip out there doing the TV show. I can't remember who was polling him, but they they came in. I entered the the uh, that little eastern cut coming in, and there was nobody in there. Mm-hmm. So I just kind of went out middle there and i started pulling down a little bit right just off the off the uh, southern bank at an incoming tide and i'm pulling along and these two boats came in went around me and came in and came right on that point halfway down and set up and 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 it was obvious one of them had a tripod they were filming and i saw them and said i think that's flip one there but i can't tell who it is and I just didn't want to mess with them. They were filming, so I pulled way out in the middle and pulled around those guys. And then after I got 200 yards down, I started pulling back in toward the wall. And as I was coming down, I had a guy named Billy Collette who owns uh, – he's a six-foot-six guy, and he owns uh, Alaska Trout Fitters in Cooper Landing. And he had never caught a tarpon. He was a great caster. And I pulled up there, and, and I looked down the bank, and here comes this big female, 150, 100, 140 to 160-pound female. And she's just cruising up the bank nice and slow. So I kind of get in there, and I turn the boat, and I said, Billy, you tell me when you can make that shot. I want you to lead that fish by 10 feet. Just put that fly in water. It was a, it was a blue cockroach. And he said, okay, I got it. So I stopped the boat. I stopped the boat, and, and, and as I turned it, he made this cast, and it just went plop right in the face of that fish. And that fish just went, sucked it in. He set the hook, and the thing went right past us, right up the bank. I turned around. The next thing you know, it's, you know, we were fishing, we were fishing reels that didn't have good drags and, you know, horrible equipment back then. And, and as we're coming up, the fish goes and runs straight between the camera boat and Flip's boat <laughs> and jumps right in front of their boat, and it was a monster fish. And they were filming. And I just pulled right between them and just kept on going, and we went up there and caught the fish. When we got the fish, I mean, it was two hours later. I leadered the fish. We took pictures of it let it go. Turned around. They were gone. Never nothing else and we were in a little cuban place in marathon that night about 7 30 having dinner a place called don pedro's and here came flip and his crew and he walked over and congratulated us on the fish and he says i can't use it because you got the wrong color motor on your back <laughs> it was pretty cool what what kind of biomass are you seeing now? You fished last night. You know, here we well, are. You know, I, I find it ama- temp- I find it amazing here. Let me set the pace here with with you. What you've seen all those years. 
Uh, here we are in April 2024. I find it amazing that you're still fishing. You, that passion is still really vibrant. What have you seen? What do you see the biomass? Uh, what does it look like now? I would say overall there's... I, see, I don't see the ocean side fish because I don't go out there. I go out three times in my in my 21-foot Jones Brothers on the ocean side to one of my old spots and anchor up. I know the fish are going to come in the next half hour, and I just sit there and look at the Internet. And then when, when I see that big school of fish come, and I stand up on the bow, and I throw a fly, hook the fish, never pull the anchor. I just fight him from a dead boat, bring him up, let him go, and then I pull the anchor and go home. Mm-hmm. I, I'm I, talking about what are you seeing uh, at so night, the, like a behi on the last night. night. I, I mean, throughout the whole when, year. When I seriously, you know, remember that I was out there drifting with lefty in the boat in the in the 1970s throwing whittled cedar plugs and and jumping a tarpon on every cast we drifted out there for years just just jumping tarpon off and you could get as many as you want it didn't matter there was thousands and thousands and thousands of fish all the way through the season i would say that there might be 20 percent of the fish that were there and overall numbers that were there in the 1970s. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's 20% left, 25%. But I don't know. I have no way to judge. I just know that 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 when I when I actually decided that I wasn't going to be I had two hip replacements, I got a six level fusion in my lower spine, a three level in my neck, an artificial ankle, and I just decided that I didn't think I could stand on the tower safely. And this was uh, 2007. Mm -hmm. So that's when I actually started full-time taking my clients out and and transitioning. I didn't want to quit fishing, but I was not able to do the flat stuff anymore. I didn't think I could. I I can still, but I didn't want want to, so I started doing this stuff. And the bottom line is that when we got out there, we we would hook – a tarp in every five minutes that we weren't that that we weren't fighting a fish. So the four hours, we never went longer than five minutes without being hooked to a tarp. Well, and what's it like now on a good night? And, and now I can tell you that that this is early in the season. The large numbers of fish aren't here. I don't know if they're going to be here. I can tell you that. Uh, since I, I I fished I think twelve days this month, and w- we're jumping a fish every forty five minutes and landing a fish less than every two hours at night. At night, that's still pretty good. That's really good. I want those numbers. Yeah, I mean, I could I could take you guys out there and you, and you could land you could land a four hour charter. You'd land four or five tarpon. Wow. Yeah. So you get a lot of fish I'm, there. I'm, I might have to. I might have to. Uh, you know, show you a few things about fighting them, but but you can land them. Pretty we, we, <laughs> I'll take. I'll, we, I'll, I'll go with you on we, that one. We land these tarp in um, in w- fishing twenty pound tippet. We have the fish land on the side next to the boat, and I grab a hold of it, take the fly out in three to four minutes. Fish up to one hundred and ten pounds. Three to four minutes. The, f- the fish yeah. is toast. Yeah, and and and, and the main thing I want to see that. And the main thing that I tell my clients. That's the most important part of my system are the reels. And those reels that I use, you know what they are. And they're, they yeah, have, sure. But what pound, have how much drag do you put on your reels? On a 20 pound, t- on a 20 pound, t- a 20 pound tippet, class tippet, I have six to eight pounds of pressure from the hook up to the end. And the rod, this, the main secret is that under no circumstances do you ever allow that fish, no matter what trick it uses, Never once ever do you allow that fish to put any bend in that rod. Okay, look, I'm gonna I'm gonna right I'm gonna call rail. bullshit on this, Jake. Right off the reel. Three minutes, 150 pound fish. No, not 150. My, you did, we're you not just catching. said, yeah, fish up to 120 pounds. They're three, three to five in minutes. three minutes with three. six pounds of drag. Yeah, I don't believe it. I was telling you what it is. I want to see I, it. What's his name? Uh, 
this the guy that fished with me last night didn't believe it. Um, Brian, how can a, it, hey, look? Uh, what I happens have, is when the fish eats. Right. Remember, we're in deep water. There's nothing around. That fish eats and he takes off with that with that six pounds of drag, six to eight pounds of drag. And as he's going, the rod's just pointing like this. The fish will run. They'll probably jump five or six times and be 50 yards into the backing by the time I tilt the motor down, start the motor, and get the boat running. Within another 30 seconds, if the angler can do this and not this. No, I get all that. If I got the guy that can turn the handle, I, I'll be on top of that fish. So you're just saying leader in the rod tip? Yeah, leader in the rod tip. I thought you said laying uh, there next I got to the you. boat. Yeah, no, you. well, it, it, leader of fish, it, it, I understand. No, that. we're, I, I, we're I, leader in the fish, and then and then I just grab them. And the then fish, break it off. Usually when I grab them, I just hold on, give them a little yeah, bit, okay. and take them, and then swing them up to the top. Th- that's the difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, a different that's like the deal. holly the that's Holly a holly stuff. release. Yeah. yeah, you run them. No, down no, we're not. Yeah. We're not making it so you can kill them. I'm, I don't want right. to. Do, I don't want to wear that fish out. Yeah, right, you're right, not right, taking right. a fly out of where, 120 pound fish in three minutes. Where you're I'm, breaking the leader. Where I'm fishing. Yeah, I'll pop the. There you go. I'll, okay. I'll pop the leader. Okay. Yeah, that makes but, sense. But I got the leader. Yeah, yeah, I got it. I got and, it. And, and there's a lot of times where the fish is actually laying. We caught a fish last year that was probably close to 200. That was out. Instead of going normally, the fish always go with the current eventually. This fish went up current and took me way up around that little, uh, is it Don Quixote? And all the way up behind that little key up in there towards uh, No Name and in two feet of water. He went up in there, she went up in there and just laid there and we pulled and pulled and pulled. But the water was so shallow, Couldn't I could run you. right up on the fish and I ran past it and took a hold of the leader. Right. And 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 the fish was going this way and I just held on and she just went like this and laid right around here and came up to the boat and I took the fly out. And it was a really big fish. I, I would say 180 at least. And we got the fly out of that fish. Let's talk about your bill fishing. Yes, sir. Um, you have a technique and I like to I'd like to um I made some calls you know, uh, because I need some intel from your friends sure. about what you've done. And I think the greatest endorsement that I found came from the chairman of the IGFA, Ray Kroniker. Mm-hmm. He said, you're one of the greatest assets for the IGFA. You fish IGFA leaders and tippets and what you've done uh, with everybody that you've brought to the game. You've multiplied the audience you teach them the correct ways to catch these fish. And when I first heard how your methodology and how you fish, I was suspect. You know, only one pound of drag. And I heard you in a previous podcast say, I can catch your child a blue marlin. You know, that, that's a pretty big statement. But Roy said, I tried for years to catch a blue marlin. I couldn't catch one. The first day I fished with Jake Jordan, I caught four. Mm-hmm. That there's something to your methodology. Well, the best the the best fly fishing billfish fisherman in the world is Nick Smith. And I put the fly line, the fly rod in the hand of Nick Smith first time he ever fished. He fished with Buddy Gramer, but he was down there fishing six pound spin at the original Fins and Feathers, 1980, 80, I mean, 1990, 91. That's in Guatemala. 92. Yeah. I'm sorry, 2001, 2002. And it was the original Fins and Feathers. We were sitting at the bar, and I had two ladies fishing with me. And if I think the first day that he fished, my two ladies that had never fly fished before caught one more sailfish in the day than he caught fishing with Bud on the Intensity. The next day, they outfished him again. And that night, sitting at the bar, he says, all right, show me this stuff. Because Ron Hamlin, Bud Grammer, and myself were kind of breaking his chops a little bit. Mm -hmm. And from that time on, he spent millions and millions and millions of dollars and fished more than anybody else ever for billfish on a fly rod and has landed. 
I think he's being inducted into the Hall of Fame next year. I'm going to be there. I'm not mistaken. There. Yeah. I'm going to be there. Yeah. I, yeah. I think he's one of the five. He invited me to. Uh, you mentioned the name uh, Ron Hamlin. I fished with Ron. I remember you know. when you came down to fish around. Yeah. Were you there when I was down Nico, there? Yeah, I was there at the lodge. I was there with uh, Trey Combs. You were with and Trey. And we were filming uh, Sportsman's Journal. Yep. I think Nico was your was your mate with Ron. No, it was Eddie and uh, Eddie and Jose were your mates. Yeah, I don't remember the and, names, but I remember yeah, well, we were with Ron Hamlin. See, when, but, we, when we went down there, originally, long before you guys got there, they had never seen a fly rod. There wasn't really any charter boats there. There was no marina there. There was no port there. There was just a little inlet where they brought in the shrimp boats and a little kind of an intercoastal thing, and there was a gas station with a dock out front. And and that gas station is where we brought the first boats when we came from Costa Rica and came down there and started fishing. And I, I was down there with Tim Choate when he first started, and Tim was kind of my guy that allowed me to – move my sailfish school, which this year was the 31st year fishing in Guatemala. Oh, wow. And my clients have caught tens of thousands of sailfish mm-hmm. on the fly. But when we got there, nobody ever saw a bimini twist. Nobody knew anything. Right. Ronnie and I fished together long before that down in Venezuela. And he fished with me in Marathon in the Florida Keys in the 1970s. Wow. So I know Ronnie for, he was one of my guys. He was the Big game fishing, he was probably one of my favorite guys as far as developing new stuff. He was the first guy to make it mandatory to fish with circle hooks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I want to ask you, I don't want to cut you off here, but I, I want to get to your methodology. Okay. So if I'm not mistaken, you have a really heavy fly line near the shooting head. It's not really super heavy, but it's a heavy head. It's a, so it gets, so basically the, a, the the line gets in the water with only one pound of drag on the fish. This line is basically lower than the fish in the water calm, so the fish wants to jump and pull away from that that resistance. Right? How did you come up with this whole thing and and and, and clarify exactly what that methodology I'll, I'll, I'll is? I'll tell you how this started. This started in the keys. And I'll take you right through the whole thing and explain to you why we're catching these marlin the way that we're catching them. When we started, we started with, with old tarpon lines and, and the traditional knots that we use for tarpon fishing with all bright knots and, and, and nail knots and, and, and standard tarpon leaders and stuff. And what I knew right away was that, a, that, that with the biggest backing that we could get, the strongest backing was 30-pound Dacron. Mm-hmm. So the biggest reel was was the was the Finor number four, or the 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 uh, Billy Pate tarpon, which was a four inch reel, and they they would hold a couple of hundred yards of backing, of thirty pound backing, and and a full floating fly line. So when I started really doing this stuff seriously, um, I I went down to to um, Costa Rica and I spent six months down there working at a place rebuilding an old lodge that had been closed and every day me and my mate would go out and we would pull a teaser and throw flies and the only gear I had was my tarpon gear and I think we six months I think I jumped I don't remember the numbers but but close to 200 billfish that I actually hooked Mm -hmm. and I think I landed six and, and these are sailfish, mostly? sailfish and marlin mixed. Mm-hmm. And what I found out was that the hooks were dull, so they always threw the hook. You had to sharpen every hook out of the box; they were all dull. Sure. The the leader material and the knots that we were making were were not very good material, and the knots were not very good. The the, the fly lines when a fish jumps sideways, come come out of a wave into the next wave. The fly line would grab. And as it came into the water and it break the tippet because the line's going sideways. Mm-hmm. Fish were so much faster than tarpon. So it just, pow, it would break it off. I found a lot of stuff. The rods were the biggest rod that we had then was a, was a G Loomis Mega 1213. Mm-hmm. There was nothing any heavier than that. There was no bigger rod. The, the reels didn't have enough backing. We would come to the knot a lot of times on an initial run. 
So I came back and, and I started working with Don Green at Sage and Gary Loomis and different guys on different rods. And I, I had prior to that a business that was called STH. I had a factory. I had a partner named Roberto Sacconi and we built fly reels in Argentina. I had gotten sold that business and I was now on my own and I had met a guy named Jack Charlton who's had the desire to build a reel. I had done a little consulting for Penn and we kind of built those Penn International fly reels. I was involved in the design of that fly reel and the drag system, which was the HT100 disc. So to make a long story short, I worked with Jack. He's, his first reels had cork drags and I convinced him to go to go to carbon fiber and we became really close friends and I, I have some of the original Charlton reels. So now we had a good reel that you could adjust the drag on. I went with uh, Marlon Roosh, uh, worked with um, Jim, uh, the guy that started Rio, Jim Vincent. Oh, you're right. And, and I worked with those guys. I had worked with Scientific Angler with Bruce Richards and I had worked with Cortland and and it would take six months to get a good fly line built. So I, I could work with these guys and, and I would tell them what I want. They would send me that week. I would have three lines and an mm -hmm. A, B, and C. And I'd tell them this one's the best, but you need to do this. So after two months, Marlon sent me some, some lines and I said, this is perfect. And basically what we needed was a 550 grain, 30 foot head. And that's what everybody in the world uses now for billfish. How did you come and, up with that? Well, the heavier lines sink too much the, and to pull the fly down. We need, we need to fly on the surface. They, they would pull the fly down. They would sink too much, and you couldn't pick them up and recast them. Right. The, the lighter lines would jump out of the waves. And, I, and we were using Jim Teeny lines. We were using all these different lines, and we were breaking them at hinges. So Ronnie came up with the idea of using – the sleeves with the with the Dacron, and we use 80-pound Dacron. We make a sleeve with a loop, and every fly line we put a Dacron loop on the end of it, on both ends. Right. And 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 on a on the back of our butt section, we put a Dacron loop, 80-pound test, on, on an 80-pound butt section. And that's that's uh nine feet long, and then it's got a crimp at the end of it. Then as you come back into the line the crimp was on the fly line with the loop, uh, was with was the, the crimp was on the on the butt section to make the loop that you loop your leader on to put your fly on. Mm -hmm. Then you, you got your butt section and that's got an 80 pound Dacron loop to loop, which goes through the guides. Like there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. Smaller than the line. What they call it wind on. Right. That, yeah. So wind -on Ron, Ronnie had done, uh, invented the wind on. So we started doing it in fly fishing at the back end. What we found is that if you use a fly line, a lot of times that'll come tight and pop because there's not enough stretch in it. So since we're fighting the fish without bending the rod, when you guys are bending the rod, you got the short end of a lever and, and, and that bending rod is a big spring. Mm -hmm. So when the fish takes off, he's pulling against that spring and you got the short end of the stick. So you got the bad end. He's got the strong and it's easier for him to go. Sure. So you feel like you're putting on 20 pounds and you're putting on two. No, I understand. So now. You're fine. I well, just wanted to what, scoot that. So point. now what we did was we take the, we, we, we take on the back of that fly line, and I made a piece of 20 pound, I mean, a piece of 50 pound Suffolk Superior is what we use now, but we used to use Andy, monofilament 80 feet long. You put an 80 pound Dacron loop on each end of that 50 pound, and now you put it loop to loop. So now you got your fly line on the piece of monofilament, and then that piece of monofilament 80 feet away is onto a big bimini on your 65 pound gel spun that's looped the loop and I got 700 yards of gel spun sure. on that on that reel. So now what happens is if you're winding and the line comes tight and the fish takes off this with a tarpon too. If you're dead straight and you're winding and the fish goes the other way, you have 2 tenths of a second to get your hand off the handle or pow the line breaks and you thump up your knuckles. With that piece of monofilament in there You've got two and a half seconds instead of two tenths of a second. Mm -hmm. Right, stretch. So it, it yeah. stretches twenty feet before the twenty pound tippet breaks. 
you got a you got a twenty foot stretch. So you got a rubber band in your line. Sure. Right. So now you're hand lining. When you're pulling on that fish, you're pulling this way, winding forward, pulling this way, winding forward. And you can feel it when it comes to the end, when that stretch is out there, you can feel it starting tension. Yeah, I'm holding on to this thing. I just move my hand. That reel goes. Yeah, sure. And then you catch him up again and you put pressure, but it's steady pressure. And I know exactly what the pounds of pressure is on the point of the hook in the fish's mouth. And everything in that whole system is breaking at least 50 pound test, except the 20 pound tip. So nothing ever should break when you're pulling on that fish, except the 20 pound. So therefore, if none of my system breaks, the reels don't break, the rods don't break, the lines don't break, the leaders don't break, the only thing that breaks is the 20 pound. So now we should catch every fish unless the angler makes a mistake and breaks the 20 pound. Well, let me ask you this. That's all, I mean, I get all that That's the when physics. the fish is out, you know, two, three, four, five hundred 500 yards, okay? What happens when you get the fish closer to the boat? and you have the, the head in your hand, and you're trying to fight that fish here, are you still using only one pound of drag? And, and no, you, no, and no. you want to with, grab the bill. With, with the marlin, here's the story with the marlin. This is where I'm going to go with the marlin. Now you, now you know what the system is. Sure. So now when you make your presentation to a blue marlin or a black marlin, th- this doesn't apply to striped marlin or white marlin or sailfish. It's different drag setting. You set the drag at one pound. If you go to two pounds, when the blue marlin hits that thing, he's going to break the tippet. So at one pound, as he hits it, you don't set the hook. You don't do anything. Your cast is never farther than 25 feet. You throw the fly in the water, your water load. When the boat comes out of gear and the captain says cast, that means the boat is no longer underway according to the IGFA rules. You take your fly, you load the fly. I do a a continuous pressure cast or an elliptical cast. I throw it out to the side, up over the top, and I want the widest, biggest loop that you can possibly throw, and I want the fly to go out of the white water to the other side and plop in the water at exactly the same time that that teaser is coming into the boat. A quick question here. Yeah. Do you throw the fly in front of the fish or behind him? Each fish is different, but blue marlin, you fl- throw the fly where the teaser is, and the marlin's chasing the teaser. Here's my question, though, and I've, and I've done this marlin fishing every time and and sail fishing too every time i put the fly in front of that that marlin he bites it and when i set the hook uh and he, he you know like like the sailfish will come up behind it and the fly comes out every time yeah but, well, that, but if well, i throw the fly behind the fish you pull the teaser out and he hears that pop behind him now you get the going away bite we're talking about two different things but i i can explain to you the, exactly what you're talking about. We we did all that in the very beginning, and we realized that 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 having a fish eat the fly when he's coming toward the boat. First of all, a blue marlin. If you ever see that happen, it's a it's a mistake. Something weird happened because no blue marlin. They go left and right. No yeah. blue marlin ever ate right. a fly coming at the boat or going right. away from the that's boat. A, that's a hundred times out of a hundred, they're going to eat the fly this way. My fly is this long. The bite tip it hits here. The fly swings into the mouth. They can eat two basketballs. The fly swings into the mouth, and as they're going away, that single hook grabs them right here mm-hmm. as, as it's a hinge coming back. And as they're going away, there's only one pound of pressure. If you have two, when that comes tight, it'll break. Yeah. They're so fast. So when he, when he eats the fly, if he go on to the left, you're just, you're, your cast is like this. When he eats it, this is my hook set. And then when he starts jumping... Then I bring the rod in, put it in my gut, and and follow him around, always pointing the rod directly at the fish. And the handle's just spinning like crazy. Sometimes I'll sit down, hold the rod like this, drink a Gatorade, not even look at him, give him no respect, let him jump, do whatever he wants out there, because there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing anybody can do about it. He's going to jump. So when he's 100 feet out, 150 feet out, on that monofilament, and he's going, and he's as he's going away really fast because he feels that thing in his mouth, even though there's no pressure on him, he's going away. And as he's going away out there, you'll see him starting breaking the surface. What's happening is that the sinking line is pulling down. So now what he's feeling is the leader coming out of his mouth down like this, and that's making a bow underneath of him. The more he feels that downward pressure, he starts leaping. 
and greyhounding. And as he does that, he goes around in a circle. And as he's going away, you're just holding on and spinning that reel and having a good time. Relax. And you can sit down. You do whatever you want. I don't care. Just make sure that you're ready so that when that handle stops turning, you can grab that thing and start putting pressure on. In the meantime, we're backing up all the whole time trying to get to that fish. And the ideal situation is that you always, when you get any slack, you're always in the aft port corner of the vessel and your fly rod, you hold it at a 45 so that the captain can back up next to your line and he can put a loop right here by the boat that's going out to wherever that fish is jumping. And then as he's backing up, your your rod is like this and you're just going like this and you're watching that loop and you're just picking slack up. Same thing what the, Rob Fordyce boat, does to get his release. The boat's picking up. We're, we're picking up the slack like this. I just was tarping all the time. You're just going like this. And, and then if you see that loop go past you, that means he's going faster than the boat. Get your hand off of there and he'll just pull that rod tip up out of the water. As soon as you get slack, you stick the rod tip in the water and you start winding again. So the way you're fishing. So, so the reason that the fish is jumping is because he feels that downward pressure. And he's going to, in the first two or three, five minutes, is going to jump 30 times. And every time he's jumping, he's going 20, 30 feet and belly flopping and it's kicking the heck out of his gut. He's wearing himself out on the surface. Prior to us knowing this, figuring this out, we would try to apply pressure right away. As soon as you pull on the fish here, he goes straight down, and nine out of ten of the fish are going to break you off down there. You can't get them. When they jump, they'll have such a big bow in the line coming up that the tip will break when they make the jump. So you got to keep them up on the surface. That's, that's what I do that nobody else does is keep them on the surface all the time. And, and then we're, we're following that fish around. You're still at one pound of pressure until you get up to the running line. When we get back on that running line, maybe five, ten minutes, you just go like this and you go to the second mark on the rail. Now you're at exactly three pounds. So now every time that fish takes off, first of all, he's all beat up from, from, from jumping. So now every time he takes off, he's feeling three times the pressure that he started with, and he's ten times more tired than he was when he started. And he's now he's not able to go deep because he's tired and he's laying on the surface and you see his tail going like this and you're watching him. Now we're backing up and backing up. And every time he runs, now he's feeling you just as soon as he takes off, you just point it at him and relax, drink a Gatorade, do whatever you want. Whenever whenever the boat can go faster than the fish, then we start putting line back on. So the way you're fishing, it seems like the most unimportant part of the whole fight is the rod. Yeah, the, the, the only the only reason to have the fly rod in the game is to cast. Is, is to cast, and at the very end, at, at at the very end, when you guys are trying to get a tarp into the surface, you know how hard you work, which are which are twelve weights or eleven weights, and you're trying to do the down and dirty and flip them upside down, all the stuff that we do with tarp and trying to get them to the surface. The reason is because you got this big giant spring lever and you're not putting any pressure. As soon as the guide can grab a hold of that leader, he can pull that fish right to the top with two fingers. Well, we don't fish like that. You know, that's the uh, the guys who don't know how to fish. Exactly. Have a big bend in the but road. But you know what I'm talking yeah. about. That's it's, the average person, but yeah, I'm just talking yeah, about. Yeah, I'm not talking about you guys. Let's, but just, let's just say, what? What would you do with somebody like us? My 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 philosophy. Would, we, would you when we get to the shooting head and the fish is twenty feet away? All right. Because let me finish. Because with tarpon, we hang onto the fly line, and I can go. I know exactly where I'm at yep. on my leader uh, or on my tippet. I know how much pressure I can put. So with tarpon, we try to pull about twelve pounds of drag, but the but the drag setting might be at four pounds. So if the fish jumps, you know it's not a heavy drag setting you're not going to break him off. But when he's right here, the rod is relatively straight. We lift with our legs and our back. Yeah, I understand. Not here. But now we have 12 uh, pounds of, of drag. Would you do you're, that with us if yeah. we were marlin fishing oh, yeah, with sure. you? Or no, not you... marlin fishing, no. But, 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 but with tarpon fishing, I would. But, but, but my philosophy is that if you go like this, this is the most efficient. A straight line. A hand line. Is, is the most efficient. A hand line. Right. So, so basically, if you, if you look at grander fishing, which I did a lot of in the chair, the reason that they invented bent butt rods is because when you push with your knees in the chair, you're pulling the rod this way. Then you're sliding forward and putting the slack on. Pulling this, this is what I'm doing with the marlin. Exactly right. I'm doing this. 
And, and, and the marlin, by the time I get him to, when, when I get the fish on the fly line, now you're 45 feet from the fish's mouth. And that tarpon, that marlin is just laying on the surface with his tail going like this. The boat is going a knot and the fish is swimming at a knot. And I'm just pulling him back like this, winding forward, pulling him back like this. Are you backing get, the fish up with two pounds of drag? Until three, I get the leader on. But are no, you, I'm at six pounds of drag now. So you can back a fish up with six pounds? A marlin? Eventually, you're going to... Basically, the fish is swimming at one knot, and the boat is going at one knot, and you're just bringing the fish back so, till he's here until you got the leader in. Now, that, that's a leadered fish. Mm -hmm. That's what we call a caught fish. Right. Then, at that point, I turn that drag up to 10 or 12 pounds. That fish is just laying there. He's not jumping. He's not doing anything. Right, so you and actually at, at get to... Time, so now, now, I'm applying this pressure... And I'm swinging that fish around, and we'll move the boat around. So now that the boat is driving along here and the fish is here, so now he's right there, and I'm in the corner of the boat. The fish is actually swimming right next to me. I'm looking at his face, and I can see the fly. I can see the thing coming out of his mouth. At that point, I am pulling 12 pounds up, mm -hmm. and then I'm winding down slow, no jerkiness straight line mm -hmm. no, and I, I can wind right on to the but i can wind right on to the class tippet mm -hmm. no and, i understand you know and so bring, bring it right to the surface and then and then once i get him up there i get him to a certain point we have a thing called a snooter that's basically a v-shaped gaff hook like this but no point on it it's got a piece of of uh, uh, uh of that rubber that they make the handles for the fishing rod the black stuff uh it's like a rubbery. Yeah, I know trigger. what you're talking about. So it's like this. It comes to a V. So it, it, we got an eight-foot handle. So now when the fish is there, we just take that thing and slide it over the bill and come up close to his face. And as you come up with that thing, the Velcro holds it here. We lift the bill up, and the mate grabs the bill. Mm -hmm. Once we get a hold of that bill, the fish will give you a little bit, and he just holds on. And then, then we take that fish bring him up and the first thing we do is try to get the fly out of his mouth mm -hmm. we get the fly out of his mouth and then we get the fly wound onto the rod and then we get the angler over there and we got the stick and we take the picture of the fish in the water we used to pull him in the boat but we just take the picture of the fish right next to the boat in the water and then we just let him go we get him swimming do you find this methodology um scoot in just a little bit yes sir i'm sorry there do you, you find this methodology being used by other fishermen around the world Guys that have fished with me and the guys that I've taught, but There's, I mean, I mean other people than your tutelage. Well, I think I think the word gets out. People have made videos of it and talked about it. People will see this on here and they'll try it. Mm -hmm. um, in general, I mean, I don't try to have any secrets. So I have people call me up on the phone and talk to me for hours, wanting to know, and then they go fish and they call me and say, "Hey, thanks, man." No, I understand. I'm just asking. Do you see other guides in Australia and around the world that are chasing world records? Uh, world record billfish using the, this methodology that you've uh, invented and designed? I would say that in Australia, like where Roy is right now, mm -hmm. th those guys are using my system. Right. Uh, yeah, he if, is, if, for if, sure. If, I if you to go him. to Kona and you fish with Kevin, they're using my system. Interesting. If, if you go to Dominican Republic, fish with GJ, VJ Bell or, or Timmy Richardson, they're using my system. My system is is kind of well-known worldwide against by guys, Nick Smith. Everybody that f chases billfish seriously with a fly rod, Pat Ford will tell you. That's the system that we all use to be successful. Uh, Brad Phillips, I taught him how to fly fish. You, you know, guys guys that are famous for running boats, Mike Sheeter, Chris Sheeter, those guys were not billfish fly fish. I mean, Tim Choate put me on the boat with him and had – learn these guys how to catch these fish on a fly rod. And, and in the beginning, we were, we were getting like in Guatemala 30 years ago. Uh, I think I fished for four years down there and fishing with Ronnie on the Captain Hook. We were the first boat in the world to catch 10 sailfish on fly in one day. Yeah, but, you know, you're talking and about sailfish. we got better and better. Yeah, but, I, you know, I, wouldn't, I would rather, you know, use – talk about marlin. Well, we started because, with sailfish and then we moved to, to compare – Fishing and techniques with a Pacific sailfish doesn't really matter. They don't really pull that hard. 
I mean, everybody understands that anybody who's caught a Pacific Silver well, com- knows I'm, that. Yeah, but you're. It's a, it's a, they, you, they, you, they pull hard compared to a brim. If you take it, a if you take a Pacific no. sailfish of a hundred pounds and a tarpon of a hundred pounds, and you use exactly the same tackle in the same boat with with the same fly rods, fly reels, and everything, the sailfish and the tarpon, Pacific sailfish, hundred pounds, and tarpon of a hundred pounds in my power speed category are equal. I tell you what, I completely disagree. You're using I, two I, different stuff. But I think the power of an ocean swimming 100 pound tarpon would skin that sailfish. But the sailfish is much faster well, and together Yeah, but they die in 30 t- seconds. Together they have minutes. they have a speed power rating of X. Okay, but look, I I understand this, but I've caught Pacific sailfish a few. I've caught 10,000. Okay, of them. fine. But they don't pull that hard. I disagree. They really, they it's Pacific, just agree to disagree. It's I disagree. Fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, the sailfish is much faster. And, and I've had sailfish using, using really heavy tackle that, that, that with good anglers with Ronnie Hamlin that, that take two hours. When I was in Pacific, when I was at the Fin and Feathers, I was really disappointed by how hard they of pulled. Of course. And, okay. and, and I can understand that. So you agree that. with me, though. I, I can understand that happening if you catch a few sailfish. But you're going to get a sailfish that, 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 that will outpull any tarpon that you've ever had. Uh, in the same tackle, in the same deal. What you're talking about is a fish in shallow water as opposed to a fish in deep water. A whole lot of different things going on. But... The, the bottom line is that I've always said, and I believe this with all my heart, that 100 pound, all these fish are 100 pound. A tarpon and a sailfish in the same condition, same boat, deep water, same tackle, are going to be a power speed rating of X. A 100 pound white marlin or a 100 pound striped marlin is going to have a power speed rating of XX. Mm-hmm. A black marlin, 100 pounds. Power speed rating XXX, a blue marlin and a blue fin tuna, a hundred pounds, six to ten X's. Yeah, I understand. So, so that's the that's the deal. The the blue marlin was always the toughest. So a blue marlin fights three times harder than a black marlin if if at the same both, if they're both a hundred pounds. Yeah, really. Yeah. What about a swordfish? Swordfish are different because because you're fighting them t- completely different. They're deep. Uh, the, the, they're not. They they slash around a lot more. It's it's hard to catch right, them with light right. tackle. But they don't do but if, real long. But if runs. you have heavy tackle, if you have heavy tackle and you hook them on, you just reel them in. How, does this technique work with uh, tuna, like yellowfin tuna? It, I, I've caught a lot of yellowfin tuna on fly doing this stuff. It, it, uh, it, I don't. I can't imagine I, a tuna coming to I, the surface. I don't like tuna fishing. I don't like grouper fishing other than I eat them all the time, but I don't like fly fishing. I started out my career with bonefish permit tarpon. I ran a, a fly fishing school for bonefish in the Bahamas starting in the 1970s. And, and then I grew into people wanting to catch permit and wanting to catch tarpon. Then those people wanted to get something bigger and we started sail fishing. Then we moved to the striped marlin and the white marlin. Then we moved up and finally figured out after years and years and years, I think I fished 13 years and broke off 119 blue marlin before I caught the first one. Wow. And, you know, now I've now I've caught 97 blue marlin on 20-pound tippet. Are you fishing okay. a lot around the fads, or is this just out on reefs? and? Well, when, when you say the fads, you know, fads are just a – a, a structure and just like any wreck you have out in the Gulf of I Mexico. Should, I should say uh, artificial. Uh, we're, we're fishing on the, the areas that I'm fishing in Costa Rica, where is my large numbers of marlin have come, are are on mountaintops that we have actually dropped an anchor and put something on top of it that holds bait. Right. It's so the bad. fish are always there around these mountaintops. What we're doing is actually getting the fish to have more bait to stay in that general area. And there's 39 of these mountaintops out there that 
different people fish for different reasons and all different stuff. But they're called fads, right? Fish attractive devices? No, fish aggregating. Oh, aggregating devices. Fish aggregating devices. They're they're all over the world. They're in Kona. So you're fishing around these fads that get a lot of... I mean, the answer is that I I never say that I'm fad fishing. What I say is that I'm fishing sea mounds that are 100 to 200 miles off the coast of Costa Rica in a big ditch. And there's mountain ranges underwater... And we fish sometimes an area that's 25 miles long. That's a ridge between two mountains. Oh, cool! And there, there might be a there might be a, a a structure on top of one of them, and maybe another one on the other one. But we're picking up three or four marlin in between, mm-hmm. and and we're finding now since we've got we've got the best equipped I I believe 42 foot sport fisherman boat in the world. And we've got everything on that boat to stay out there for five days and still get in safely, have enough fuel. We've got ice makers, water makers. We've got generators. We've got air conditioning. Sure. We've got we've got sonar. It's we've a got, house. <laughs> yeah, we've got we've got we've got the the, the sea keepers to keep the boat from from rocking at night when you're sleeping. I mean, we got everything on that forty two foot boat. What's it's, that? What's something like that cost for a week for somebody who wants to go fish with you? These marlin trips that I do, I do I do twelve of them. A season. My season is June first to to September first, and I'm out there. We we leave the dock on Monday. Uh, you come in Sunday, stay in my condo with me. We go out on Monday about three o'clock. We start fishing at dawn, and we fish fourteen hours a day for three days in a row. The end of the third day on Thursday night, we start in. We get in Friday morning, go to the condo, do all the editing and everything. You go home on Saturday, and the next guy comes in. I do twelve of those trips a year. Uh, all expenses, everything other than gratuities, it's eighteen five for the trip, and and that's you're buying the trip, and if you want to bring him, it's free. Mm, interesting. One person. Most most of my clients are one person, but I have about close to fifty percent are two people. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are husbands and wives. What are the regulations uh, regarding the fads? Can anyone just go out there and drop anchors and cement blocks and stuff? Well, uh, the the. The water where we're fishing is 18,000 feet deep. The mountaintops come up 1,200 feet below the surface. Wow. And you got anywhere from a zero uh, to 12-knot current. And you've got to take something that is, first of all, you got to know the depth of the actual mountaintop where you're going. And you got to build a system with an anchor to get down there, we have we 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 have anchors that we build out of concrete and steel that that weigh a ton, and then and then they've got a piece of, of stainless cable on them, and a ball as big around as this table that's all steel covered with rebel. When you get when that thing gets 160 feet from the from the mountaintop, if you're lucky enough to hit the mountaintop, then the ball goes overboard and the ball gets pulled under. And then there's a piece of, of of yellow propylene rope that floats, and on that rope are tied off either vinyl strips or like Venetian blind material or something every ten feet, so it looks like palm trees. Mm-hmm. And that's a wow. hundred foot long. Then on top of that is a smaller ball, and that smaller ball is seventy feet down. And then there's a little string that comes up to the surface with a little one of those little uh, lobster trap buoys. So then the diver goes down, make sure everything is landed on the uh, and sitting there. So from 160 feet to 70 feet, depth is your fad. Then he cuts the rope and they pull him to the top. So now there's no marking. A ship can run over it and not mess it up. And there's nothing there that know that it's, that there's anything there. The only thing there is that little ball. And that is what's called a fad. In, in general, when you're starting to put them down, about three out of four miss the mountaintop and just it's $9,000 that goes right to the bottom. Really? That's what it costs for each one, to, to not counting the labor and time and fuel and everything. How many have you been a part of? I don't have an exact number, but dozens. What do they cost? $9,000? 9000 for material. Material and, and, and then, then you need, you, then you got to have two boats to go out yeah. and, and a crew so to set them a barge. So then it's the labor. The, the initial ones 
the initial two were done with stainless steel and chains and everything, and they were done down towards the border between uh, uh, Costa Rica and Panama on on a different mountain range, right. the other end. And that, that was the ones that, that I first fished in 2011. There was only one in the beginning. I'm I'm ignorant to this issue, but is there anybody that highly like opposes the fads? I don't know. Yeah, I wondered. If, I, mean, I, didn't I, if, I, mean, I didn't know if it was I controversial mean, we in don't, any way. We, it, it, the word "fads" is controversial. People, people man-made pic- structure. People are picturing that as as something that's hurting something, and it's not doing. It's anything. not hurting anything. But but the question I have is: it pulling the marlin from from a big. Uh, um, there's From a, the ocean there's to a, there's a central a, there's location. A, there's, a, there's a canyon that's 100 yards wide, 100 miles wide. Uh-huh. And in that canyon is these mountain ranges. The marlin that are in there, the male marlin that are in there, they're mostly males. They're all small fish under 500. They come, they come up past the outside of the Galapagos. They turn and they come into that structure and they're going, here's Costa Rica and these fish are going this way up this canyon. And then when they get to the upper end of it, so... This fad might be 90 miles out. Up here, fad's 150 miles, 200 miles out. Then those fish turn and they go three months after they're there, the same school of marlin are going past just to the to the east of the big island of Hawaii. Three months later, they're down off of New Zealand. And three months later, they're coming up the, the, uh, the channel off of Chile up towards the Galapagos, they come around the outside of the Galapagos, come straight up in, and then turn and go in that channel again. We kind of think that they're servicing, servicing, servicing the big marlin in in, in uh, uh, Hawaii and New Zealand and over off of Chile. And so, if you want to chase world records, you got to chase these fish around the world. That's what these guys are doing, this, don't this they? This is just one because these fish this, are just traveling. This is just one group of fish in the Pacific Ocean that I know about because I've been on them for. Right for years, and we've been tagging them and, and tracking their where they go. We don't know much about because it. that's this year an insane migratory route. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah, because yeah, Roy- that's, that's just one group. But that that does not that doesn't have anything. If 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 we're fishing in Guatemala and Costa Rica and fishing those coastal fish, we catch blue marlin there all the time. That has nothing to do with that gene right. pool. It's a different group of right. fish. Mm-hmm. They go up and down from from, from Colombia right up all the way to Mexico and back up and down that. So uh, I remember Madeira used to be really a hotbed for granders. For big fish, yeah. And then all of a sudden, it just dropped off. Uh, they weren't there. Uh, so these migrate, the migratory routes and, can change, right? Certainly. The, the, do, you think, do you think that the tarpon that are coming down the East Coast or the West Coast are going to just swim right into that poison that they're letting out of Lake Okeechobee and do nothing? Well, they're going to go out in the ocean, go around it, and do a different route. They're not going to come right down the right. beach. Well, I understand, but Key West always has fish, uh, you know, in May coming down the ocean side, uh, tarpon I'm speaking about. But I find it interesting that Madeira that was so good for so long, is it a water temperature thing that these, these fish it's, follow? It's... It, 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 it's we don't know, but 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 I can tell you that Madeira has a ten year cycle. It's good for two or three years, then it falls off. Then it's good. Same with the Azores. Same with Ascension Island. The yeah, Azores was red hot last year, right? Yeah, yeah, right. And and Cape Verde is same. I mean, it it can be really good for years, and then and then it dies off for a while. And I don't know if we're not catching them or what the story is. I mean, there's not that many granders. Uh, it's it's the it's the same in you know in Africa. We had fish over there in in. Uh, in Africa for four or five years, and then that died off. Uh, in 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 Australia, the Barrier Reef is good, but for 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 fly fishing for blacks, I would much rather f- fish down in the in the southwest corner, mm-hmm. like Stapa. Right. You know, I mean, there's places down there that are that are just incredible for blacks in shallow water. Right. Um, you just the people that know know, and you just study it. I mean, for me. I don't have a wife to go home to. I don't have anybody that I'm involved with that is not thinking about catching billfish on a fly year round. That's in my mind. When I'm here, I'm earning money and I'm hanging out with my daughter and my grandkids and I'm in the Keys with 
running into my old friends. A lot of kids that I started, Albert Bunzo, uh, sure. a lot of them kids were, were little kids when I had my shop. And, and, and I, I love the keys, but, but realistically, the people that I knew here back in the 70s and 80s, that, are, that the families are still here, I can count on these two hands. Wow. It's all new people. Right. You know, I, I love coming here in April and May, but but it's because I've been doing this my whole life, the tarp, and I just love. Mm-hmm. But I'm thinking about the whole time, like I'm talking to this this guy that's fishing with me. I mean, we're talking about catching marlin in July. I mean, he, he and his wife are just got, they hooked that, they got that world record spearfish, and now they just want to, they want to catch billfish. Mm-hmm. So, look, you have two great passions, tarp and, and billfish. Is one greater than the other? Are they equal? no and when i'm tarpon fishing i love tarpon fishing i wish that i could stand on the front of the boat like you do and still cast to those fish all day but when i get one of these kids to take me out they all want to take me and i i can only go out for two hours and stand right, up there my right. back won't take it i just yeah. can't i can't stand in that sun all that time i get it and and, and, and that's so a lot of my clients are old guys mm-hmm. and, and and we can go and sit in the air condition and eat fresh Sushi, I can stop at any time, at any time when we're 150 miles out and take out a little nine weight with a little white clouser and flip it off the back of the boat. And within one second, I'm fighting a yellowfin tuna this long. And I can catch 10,000 of them on 10,000 casts. Wow. And and we have fresh sushi, sashimi. I want to go. Tuna every, every day, all you want. And then at night, we get to, we leave the lights on and we get the squid jigs out. And we catch a five-gallon bucket full of fresh squid and clean them up and eat fresh calamari for breakfast. That's amazing. Uh, you've had an enormously big life in fishing, Jake. Um, you know, you're world-renowned, you know, now, you know, with what you've done with the Marlin stuff. That was never my goal. Well, it, it, but you're, you're there. And when the IGFA talks about, you know, how proud they are of you, um, what would you like to be most remembered for I think for for having the opportunity to spend time and fish with such awesome brilliant great people and learn from them as I still am learning every day I mean we talk about things that I did but realistically you know the when when I went to Guatemala, there was there was no fishery there. Uh, on my 80th birthday, they had a party on the dock at the marina. There was 600 people there from the fishing industry, free Florida Canya, and and the biggest party you ever saw with two hours of of of, of uh, um, fireworks celebrating your celebrating my your, 80th your 80 birthday. birthday. Wow! And, and and I had the same thing in Exuma. It, it, I took a, a, a group of kids and taught them to fish, and now they're old men. But but there was a period when the drugs were big in the Bahamas that, that no new guides came around. Right. So then when I went down there with Bobby Hyde, we, like, wrote a program and started training guides and buying them boats. Mm-hmm. And now those guys are all retired, but their kids and grandkids are guiding. Look at how many people so, you've touched. And that is what I like is the fact that there are these middle classes of people that – that that have succeeded in life and their kids are succeeding and and you know when i come down here to the keys uh i i watched one of your many podcasts i love looking at the history that you guys are bringing out and you know i never thought that i was worthy of that i think i'm just like a fishing guy <laughs> i i ne- I, I just tried to learn stuff and pass it out lefty told me once he said jake I tried your technique on a permit down in Mexico, and he says I landed that thing on twenty pound tip, and it was a big permit, and I had it up at the boat in like four minutes. Bob Clouser told me the same thing that mm-hmm. they they use this system. And he says what I can't understand is that with all the brilliant people that we have met in our whole lives, I met Lefty when when my dad belonged to a fishing club in New Jersey in the nineteen fifties, and 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 he said Jake. With all these smart people, 
I can't believe that that's you that figured out how to catch the <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go. So there you go. Well, thank you so much for sharing your Jake, story, Jake. thanks so much for coming on. Yes. Yes. It's my pleasure. Yes. And I, uh, again, we've known each other for a long time, and it's such an honor to have you with us. Yeah. Well, I thank, th- you. I thank you, and and I hope this is what you were looking for. It's I, awesome. It's I, your story. I, I, uh, I enjoyed it. I, a lot of the stuff doesn't come up. You know, I, I always think about a a hard drive, and they used to have these things called zip drives, and you would download this knowledge, and then it would go into the zip drive, but if you didn't have the program to pull that up, you couldn't remember it. <laughs> right, right. And then you had to get a program to pull it up. Well, I feel like I got all this stuff back here, and I can't, as I'm well, talking. Well, it's our job to get that out. Yeah, as I'm yeah. talking, it comes up to the surface. Yeah. You know? Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. You, were, you, were, Appreciate you were brilliant. It. Thank you. Thanks. What a source for that story. Where so it's just a